Yeah, hi. I can't hear you, Jennifer. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, today, Dr. Atif is with us. Uh, he's finished DNB, internal medicine from CMC, worked briefly in emergency medicine, completed neurology, uh, 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 new, neurology DM, and he is working in the Department of Neurology as associate professor. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for coming. Uh, over to you, sir, for the lecture. Uh, hi. Just let me share my screen now. Uh, is the PowerPoint coming? Yes, sir, it's coming. Okay. Uh, and the slides and no. audio? Okay. No, now again the slides went off. How about now? Mm -hmm. No. Not no. coming? No, not coming. It came and then it left. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. So uh, we'll be talking about Parkinson's disease. Uh, uh, a little bit on pathophysiology, diagnosis, and management. So uh, we'll be covering mostly uh, the learning objectives. We'll be learning to uh, learn uh, know the brief pathogenesis and pathophysiology. Uh, will not delve into great details of Parkinson's disease. Uh, a lot of new uh, information has been out in the last uh, uh, five years or so. Uh, just enough to help us to an approach uh, to diagnosis in Parkinson's disease and uh, uh, how to use the criteria, how to use the clinical uh, information to come to a diagnosis in Parkinson's disease. Uh, that's something which we'll stress a little bit on on a clinical diagnosis in, of uh, idiopathic Parkinson's disease. We'll also learn a little bit about early management in Parkinson's disease. Uh, we will not cover details of pathology. A uh, lot of mo molecular biology is uh, 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 is known now. A, a lot of new things um, uh, have been discovered or rediscovered, emphasized in the last few years. We'll not cover those. We will not cover rare types of Parkinson's disease. We will just maybe a little bit touch on the subtypes of Parkinson's disease, but not delve too much inside that. Additionally, we will uh, uh, learn a little bit about advanced Parkinson's disease management, maybe just a slide or so. Now, uh, uh, the biggest problem in uh, learning Parkinson's disease is, of course, you have to see patients. Uh, I the, we have a lot of videos with us, but then uh, because this is going to be on a public channel, we can't put those patient videos online. 
so uh, do come uh, to our department anytime we all have a lot of videos uh, which help a lot in learning and obviously the best thing to do will be to see patients uh, in any of our opd we'll at least have a few parkinson's disease patients on wednesdays we have a movement disorder opd where we'll have at least four to five parkinson's disease at any given time at any on any wednesday right so uh, we'll jump into the nomenclature first uh, so uh, a, a lot of names have been called uh, a lot of isms and this and that so uh, right now the word uh, that we use mostly uh, for the disease of parkinson disease is idiopathic parkinson disease so what looks like idiopathic parkinson disease but it's not or we are not sure then we can call it parkinsonism how to come to that diagnosis i'll come to that so idiopathic uh, parkinson disease also now can be considered as a sporadic uh, idiopathic parkinson disease or a genetic parkinson's disease where a genetic uh, 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 a, a mutation that can cause or predispose parkinson disease may be uh, called a genetic parkinson disease uh, we also have a, a nomenclature called young onset parkinson disease typically used for more, less than 40 years but some people uh, wish to push it a little bit further up till 50 years of age because it has uh, slight differences in management as well we are, again then uh, the patients which do not fit into criteria or uh, uh, diagnosis of idiopathic parkinson disease we call them atypical parkinson disease and or atypical parkinsonism which is the preferred term and there are a few differentials in those now we can go into subtyping parkinson disease but it doesn't really make a difference the two large predominant subtypes which we see often are tremor predominant or a gait predominant subtype uh, so because there are so many subtypes uh, uh, whether to consider all idiopathic parkinson disease as one singular disease or there is a push to make it as a uh, syndrome rather than a disease and then look for uh, differences and causative uh, 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 causations in uh, vari variations in each of the uh, more uh, phenotypic variations so let me just ask a few questions and you don't have to really answer it here or so just answer it amongst yourself uh, what is the best way to diagnose parkinson's disease okay and the second question is if the treatment of parkinson's disease is largely symptomatic is there any therapy that can prolong life expectancy so we know that the disease doesn't change it's a neurodegenerative disease uh, is there any way how we can prolong life expectancy in a patient who comes with parkinson's disease and if i say yes can you think of one reason how okay so uh, just a touch on how to uh, uh, do a investigative study in, uh, in any neuroscience uh, uh, there are multiple layers Uh, uh a person who does molecular uh, neuroscience may not know much about clinical or circuit based uh, uh neuroscience so uh, generally uh, we have multiple layers you start with molecules in the form of neurotransmitters metabolic parameters and cycles etc then uh, you jump one layer uh, zoom out a little bit you have cell and cell wall uh, in uh, neuroscience you have in the form of synapses the neurons various neurons uh, the neurotransmitters that they uh, uh, they have they choose they secrete uh, you have the non neuronal cells the glia the immune cells which are very important so those form the cell and cell wall level of uh, neuroscience uh, all of these they form circuits and networks uh, neuronal as well as non neuronal uh, circuits and networks the common examples that we have is the direct uh, pathway motor pathway the pepper circuit for uh, memory etc and all these circuits and networks they form uh, systems so we have vision visual system we have the motor system somebody who walks so, and all these systems they eventually form an individual so uh, parkinson disease is an ex excellent study disease to study all levels of uh, these uh, all these levels because you have uh, at a molecular level you have a, a relative dopamine deficiency you have a, a alpha synuclein dysfunction uh, whether it leads to toxicity or not it's not clearly known but possibly yes and you have other neurotransmitters as well not just dopamine you have norepinephrine you have um, acetylcholine serotonin which are suspected to cause the non motor symptoms then you jump one layer ahead you have a cellular uh, le level where you have 
pigmentary uh, neurons in substantia nigra which uh, are lost early and then later on the, the rest of the brain also starts to show a uh, reduction in the uh, uh, neurons as well. Uh, and then you jump one layer, you have the direct and indirect pathways, later on cognition as well gets involved. And there are multiple systems, the largest and the predominant of which is the moment system. So we'll just see, yeah, instead of uh, blank slides, we'll just see some pictures. So this is uh, a section at the midbrain level which shows uh, uh, substantia nigra. This is how it looks like. And uh, uh, the right one is normal. And uh, the left one is where we see the dark uh, layer which was here. That is completely gone. So those are melanin producing uh, cells which are lost in Parkinson's disease. Uh, you can see that same thing in uh, tyrosine hydroxylase stain uh, where we see the normal staining of uh, uh, in a normal uh, person whereas in a patient in PD we can see the cells are completely gone and you can see some inclusion bodies which are uh, intra neuronal Levy bodies. So uh, this is at the cell and the uh, uh, histopath level. Molecularly you have misfolded proteins uh, which is alpha synuclein which form oligomers uh, fibrils and finally they form Lewy bodies which is the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease. So as you go deeper and deeper you have multiple uh, uh, layers. Uh, this is just a one simple uh, outlook of all the uh, pathology, pathophysiologies which are involved but you don't have to mark the entire slide just remember that there are uh, genetic causes so some mutations which may cause Parkinson's disease or may just predispose a person to Parkinson's disease and in addition to that there may be uh, an additional insult in the form of uh, well the well known ones are rotenone, paracoet, MPTP uh, poisonings uh, there may be others which we don't know yet so there are multiple hits or there may be one causative mutation and uh, that may lead to eventually uh, Parkinson's disease so the end uh, uh, dysfunction that is noted in most of the patients is mitochondrial dysfunction and uh, the proteasome lysosome uh, uh, dysfunction which leads to alpha synuclein uh, deposition and hence uh, toxicity and uh, neuronal degeneration. So once the process starts it's generally progressive and it keeps on spreading from one part to the other uh, and that's how Parkinson's disease becomes a neurodegenerative disease. We step one layer ahead, we go to the uh, uh, circuits. Uh, this is not the only circuit. So uh, cognition gets involved, vision gets involved, uh, autonomic pathways get involved. But uh, the major, uh, uh, the majority of the mo uh, mo motor manifestations are explained by these two circuits, which are the direct and the indirect pathways. So uh, the, uh, the function of the direct pathway is to uh, increase uh, movement. So uh, somebody who is walking, the initial uh, 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 the commands start from the uh, cortex, they go to the striatum uh, and then finally come back to the cortex. Uh, so uh, the initial, uh, when you start a movement, for example, walking, the initial uh, part is just taking care of either cortex and the spinal thalamic tract. Uh, sorry, corticospinal tracts and the movement of the muscles. But then to uh, continue doing these movements, you need the basal ganglia, uh, continuous movements, you need basal ganglia to come in. So uh, uh, the initial few steps may be very much voluntary, but then the continuation of the steps uh, will be through basal ganglia uh, and derived movements. So uh, from the cortex, uh, as a signal goes to the corticospinal tract, one also goes to the striatum. Uh, in the form of direct pathway, it comes to the GPI via D1 receptors. Then it goes to the thalamus and to the cortex. This entire uh, thing finally is a stimulatory uh, pathway. So uh, it will keep on stim uh, stimulating the uh, movement. You also have to inhibit a particular movement. Uh, 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 for example, when you are flexing your at your uh, elbow, your biceps is supposed to move, but your triceps is supposed to relax. So that relaxation is provided by the indirect pathway. The inhibition is provided by the indirect pathway. And also in general overall movement programming, The whenever you have to reduce a particular movement, the indirect pathway becomes dominant. So uh, 
that goes through the globus pallidus externa to the subthalamic nucleus and then uh, circuits back to the GPI and thalamus. This addition steps makes it uh, double negative. So this entire pathway will uh, cause an inhibition in movements. So all you have to remember is that uh, direct pathway goes directly to GPI and causes uh, stimulation of a movement, excitation of a movement and their indirect pathway causes inhibition of a movement. So uh, now what happens in Parkinson's disease, the problem is not in the direct or indirect pathway, the problem is in the substantia nigra fast compactor which is a source of dopamine. So all the dopamine comes from substantia nigra, it goes to the striatum. Whatever, uh, uh, stimulate, stimulate uh, whenever D1 receptors are stimulated, the direct pathway gets uh, uh, involved, gets activated. Whenever the D2 pathway gets activated, the indirect pathway gets uh, in, uh, excited. So, uh, now in Parkinson's disease, we have a deficiency of dopamine itself. So, both D1 and D2 receptors are not excited. So, the direct pathway is affected, leads to reduction in movement overall, as well as the indirect pathway is not excited. Uh, is not activated and that leads to uh, mostly the, the that leads to uh, uh, tremor so the systems that are affected are largely the motor system uh, uh, that is the core of crux of Parkinson disease the uh, predominant uh, movements that uh, are affected is because of a motor system involvement now, because we have a good uh, grip on motor system management uh, of bradykinesia and tremor largely, we slowly have come to realize in the last 10-15 years that a lot of non-motor uh, symptoms are also involved uh, and uh, they are largely divided into four groups, uh, the cognitive and psychiatric problems, the autonomic dysfunction, the uh, sleep problems and sensory processing difficulties, we will come to each of those. Now, uh, in Parkinson's disease, the crux of the problem is bradykinesia. It's not tremor. Although tremor is the one, the thing that we most commonly associate Parkinson's disease with, with it is not uh, the uh, broad, predominant problem. So, uh, uh, the hallmark is bradykinesia. And uh, when it comes to diagnosis, bradykinesia has more uh, 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 importance than uh, tremor. So, bradykinesia is slowness in layman's term. Uh, it's a little bit more te te uh, technical. It becomes, uh, we, you say it is decremental, decremental movements with respect to time. So, the range of movements keep on slowing down. Uh, now, akinesia and hypokinesia are very close terms. Uh, uh, so, uh, which, which may mimic bradykinesia. But however, they are slightly different. So, uh, a normal, if you can see my video, uh, uh, right. So, uh, let's say we do, we want to do finger tapping, and you uh, re uh, request the person to close the fingers completely and open as much as possible, as wide as possible. So this is finger tapping and you do it as fast as possible. So a normal speed and a normal amplitude, right? If this entire thing is the amplitude and the speed, this is normal, right? Now, if my entire process is slowed down, instead of going like this, like this, at this speed, good speed, which is normal, if my entire process slowed down, this is hypokinesia. So I am slow, but my amplitudes are good, right? or if I am complete, my amplitude is reduced and movements are slow, then that you may call it akinesia. Technically, bradykinesia is reduction in movements, uh, in the range of movements. So you start with normal and then slowly it becomes slower and slower, right? You start like that, like that, like that, and then the pace becomes the uh, movements, the amplitude of movement reduces gradually. So. Uh, now, uh, you may get akinesia, hypokinesia in spasticity, um, so some some spastic disorders which uh, are not like a stroke, rather uh, a, a differential diagnosis of someone who presents with uh, spastic paraparesis or a stiff person syndrome, uh, sometimes they can have, they complain of slowness, but it's not a true bradykinesia, it's a hypokinesia rather. 
uh, very rarely you may see element weakness, but you should be able to very clearly discern that this is not um, uh, bradykinesia or hypokinesia, rather this is motor weakness. And uh, very severely depressed patients may have re drastically reduced psychomotor movements. Their faces will be down, they won't be looking up, they'll be walking very slow, movements will be very slow. And uh, you may you, you have to make sure that that's not the case. Other rare differentials are hypothyroid slowness. Uh, very rarely you may have sometimes dystonia, which uh, posturing of a limb which causes a reduction in movements, but that's not true uh, hypokinesia again, bradykinesia. Catatonic patients again will be really rigid, uh, they may not move much and you may think whether they have actually uh, bradykinesia as well as stiff person syndrome. Where all you can look for bradykinesia, you can look at the finger, finger tapping, this is the easiest and the best way. Then you have hand movements, you open and close your hand and a Parkinson patient will start off uh, by opening the hand fully but then gradually they'll go like this, the hand may not improve open completely. Pronation, supination movements, they will be do, able to do completely initially at good pace and then they will come down. They won't be able to do at all. Similarly, arm bradykinesia, you can notice that when a person is walking, uh, how what is the range of movement of the arm. Foot dis, uh, bradykinesia, we tap the foot, we tap the entire leg as well as walk the, uh, see the patient walk and see the stride limp. Right. So uh, this is how it looks like. So uh, a normal subject, these are basically uh, uh, motion de detectors which are stuck to a person's uh, uh, limbs and a normal person will keep on having the same movement. So you start with the cortex and then the uh, direct pathway takes over and you have the same uh, movement throughout the uh, same range of movements throughout the activity whereas in a P Parkinson's disease patient you can see the reduction in movements right the same thing happens in with handwriting as well now the problem is in advanced speed it becomes a little bit difficult to pick up because the movements will be very minimal to begin with right so uh, but you may still be able to demonstrate some amount of bradykinesia the second uh, uh, ob most obvious uh, manifestation is tremor. So uh, it's a slow uh, rest tremor. Uh, now uh, this is how we uh, uh, see a tremor in the lab. So clinically you, a tremor should uh, be equal in both axes. So if it's a flexion extension tremor, it should be like this. Or if it's a uh, supination pronation tremor, it should be moved. So across the axis, the movement should be equal. So if it keeps on going like this, like this, like this, it's not a tremor. It's actually a dystonic tremor or a spasticity. So uh, for example, you can see this in the uh, uh, this diagram what we we'll try to show here. So this patient has come with a tremor in the, one of the hands, and we realize that the hand that is involved is a left hand. So if you see the, this part. So these are accelerometers which are stuck on mo motion detectors and you can see the nice sine uh, wave like pattern of the movements, right? So that suggests this is a tremor on uh, involving the left hand whereas in the right hand that is not there. Now uh, when you stick, uh, now uh, to demonstrate very well uh, you have to uh, uh, stick a surface EMG marker. Uh, on anti on two muscles which are antagonist to each other. So here is the flexor carpi radialis and the extensor carpi radialis. And uh, this line suggests uh, 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 muscle activity, right? This is when the muscle starts firing. So this is when the FCR starts firing, then there's rest, then that's fire, and then there's rest. And the ECR is the antagonist muscle that doesn't fire when the FCR is firing. So there is alternate contraction and relaxation, and this gives rise to this tremor. Right, and at the same time we see the right side is normal. This is a Fourier transform of the uh, uh, waveform. This transform basically suggests what is the place where the tremor is maximum, and we see that this is at around two hertz. So this is two, four, so somewhere here will be five. So this is around five hertz tremor. Right, I'm sorry for that. Yeah. So the differentials uh, for this tremor, 
for any trimmer is an essential trimmer, but the essential trimmer is a much faster trimmer. So what you get here is uh, two, four, six, eight, ten. So this around up till here is one second. So you have around one, two, three, four, five times the muscle fire. So five hertz is the trimmer weight. In an essential trimmer, you'll get much faster, around eight to ten to twelve hertz. Uh, the other differential is a drug induced tremor, which you have to take a history and find out. Uh, it may mimic completely like a Parkinsonian tremor. And the final uh, slow tremor differential is a Holmes tremor, which is also a Holmes tremor, but which is also a rest tremor, but it ap appears at rest as well as at action. And the frequency usually doesn't change, the amplitude increases. So that's how you differentiate Holmes tremor. Now, rigidity, uh, although we say uh, classically cogwheeling, cogwheeling, cogwheeling. The requirement is not cogwheeling. The requirement is actually a lead pipe rigidity. So if it is there, that's enough. You don't have to demonstrate cogwheeling. So you see the uh, rigidity when you check for tone, the rigid increased tone is demonstrated at all uh, levels. And there is no velocity dependence. Now other motor phenomena are gait. You can see a person with Parkinson walk, they have a short shuffling gait, arm swing is reduced, stoop, they have a face which is, uh, uh, fair, which is blank, there is no expression. They will have freezing later on, they may have a tremor when they stand up and very late uh, in the disease they may have start having falls. Uh, the handwriting bradykinesia manifests itself as micrographia, uh, reduced eye blink, this hypophonia as dis and dysphagia. Now, both motor and motor non-motor symptoms are generally present at the outset itself and both keep on increasing. Generally, the patients present when the motor symptoms start because that's when they realize that something is really wrong. The early non-motor uh, uh, symptoms are usually non-specific. So that, that's why the diagnosis, core of the diagnosis is based on non motor phenomena. However, some non-motor symptoms are included and we should be aware of these. Commonest is, co uh, uh, sorry, uh, not the commonest, the most burden is of course put by the cognitive part of uh, 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 non-motor symptoms. Uh, in the initial phases, you will see only a mild execution dysfunction. So you give them a clock to draw, they may draw it wrong. Uh, they may have a memory problem, but it's uh, not a uh, uh, memory formation that is erratic, it's a procedural memory. So it's an execution, uh, immediate memory that is lost. So uh, that is the more of a problem. They may have a tip of the tongue phenomena, and they may have uh, improvement in memory with cues. So a subcortical type of memory dysfunction. Depression and anxiety is very very common in Parkinson's disease, and it uh, takes away a lot of uh, uh, quality of life. So uh, screening for depression and anxiety should be done at every visit. Uh, a lot of patients do have hallucinations, delusions, and frank psychosis as well, which can be managed easily. Uh, autonomic symptoms. So when I asked you two things that can, some few things that can improve uh, prolonged life in patients with uh, Parkinson's disease. So till now, all we have done is improve the quality of life. Uh, but autonomic dysfunction management uh, improves prolongs life as well. So you have orthostatic hypotension, which can be very dangerous. Uh, as well as you have supine hypertension. So a patient usually comes to an OPD and you check their blood pressure and it's fine. And uh, you let the patient go. But uh, when the patient lies down, the blood pressure goes up to 180, 190 systolic. Uh, it's a common thing in supine hypertension. So uh, we have we should be able to pick that up as well and manage it because if a, uh, blood pressure goes uncorrected for a long time, it increases the cardiovascular mortality. The other place which will uh, reduce uh, life expectancy is the bladder dysfunction, especially when there is a bladder retention. So that is not very common. The commonest thing in uh, bladder manifestation is nocturia and urgency and urge incontinence. Uh, after some time, patients will have decreased hypoactivity. Some patients may have an additional uh, prosthetic problem. So you, they have a, ret a bladder retention. Uh, uh, the post void residue goes up. That can lead to recurrent infections and uh, early mortality. Constipation is another autonomic problem in erectile dysfunction. These both are very, very common. Sleep, again, uh, there is a very specific uh, sleep problem which occurs in most of the synucleopathies and that is uh, REM sleep behavior disorder. So this is described as the patient gets up in the night trying to uh, uh, shouting at someone or trying to call out to someone or just tries to uh, mimic what he was doing in the night. So in his sleep, he'll be either typing out or writing or lecturing someone, something like that. 
So uh, if you get that history, that's a very specific history of a synucleopathy, uh, and it uh, it is one of the uh, new additions in the di di uh, diagnostic criteria as well. A lot of patients do struggle with insomnia as well, uh, 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 early daytime somnolence, uh, uh, and sometimes the patients may have uh, obstructive sleep apnea as well. Now, sensory processing, the two most common things are hyposmia. Hyposmia is so common that it can be used as a screening test as well. So, you give them five different uh, things to smell and just identify it. And a lot of, most of the PV patients will not be able to identify it correctly. Pain, a lot of patients present with pain rather than tremor. Uh, and this usually is a shoulder pain or a back pain. Uh, and the pain... Uh, has m multiple uh, causes so the most common is the rigidity which reduces movements uh, restriction of movements and that's that uh, persistent posturing give rise to pain but there can be a central uh, uh, central pain as well so that uh, requires uh, management now this is a phenomenon called pareidolia so Normally, we see try uh, we have a, a tendency to see faces in a lot of things. So these are photographs where uh, uh, people have tried to see faces. But patients with Parkinson's disease uh, uh, who have cognitive impairment or some amount of psychosis, they the most common manifestation is pareidolia. So they see faces in even in like flowers, they'll see a lot of monkeys or people around, and they'll see like a crowd. Uh, you have to ask this out, and often you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised how frequently they have it. Right. So, uh, clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is, uh, the, the diagnosis is largely clinical, right? We have some investigation which may help us, but the, all the criteria, the, the, the process is largely clinical. We start with the motor first, that's the crux of the problem, and the must requirement is the bradykinesia, uh, and bradykinesia with either rigidity or tremor. Uh, is enough to say Parkinsonism, not Parkinson's disease, Parkinsonism, right? So we have learned how to diagnose bradykinesia, we learned how to diagnose tremor and rigidity. Earlier pro uh, diagnostic criteria had postural instability also as a part, but now it's been taken care of, taken, removed out of completely. Once you've done that, we have to rule out certain diseases which do not uh, which uh, completely rule out Parkinson's disease and uh, the most common ones are the uh, A so you have cerebellar involvement in MSA, supranuclear gaze paresis in PSP, uh, frontal dysfunction, uh, aphasia, uh, in uh, frontotemporal dementias, lower limb restricted Parkinson's disease in uh, which uh, stays in the lower limb for more than three years, we have other differentials for those. We should make sure there uh, there is no drug in drugs take, taken prior to this, which may explain Parkinson's disease. If there is absolutely no response to levodopa, we can rule out Parkinson's disease. There is no higher order uh, sensory dysfunction, uh, cortical dysfunction like apraxia, ap apraxia, aphasia, which may suggest a corticobasal dysfunction. A normal death scan is good to rule out Parkinson's disease, uh, although an abnormal doesn't always rule in. In the new MDS criteria, well, there is one uh, loophole which uh, a patient, a physician may use uh, when he or she thinks that an alternative etiology may be possible. For example, a patient who, the, uh, in a patient, a, a physician thinks they may have a hereditary cause like Wilson's disease or something. So they may not, uh, they may say that I, I can rule this, rule out. So this is a detailed list of the previous list or whatever I have told you before. Now, in step three, you have something uh, which uh, uh, you will know prospectively. Uh, now, this is the most important step. Uh, uh, so, uh, a, a, a person comes to you uh, on a day and uh, you make a diagnosis uh, and you record it for many, many years and the patient dies after, let's say, 15 years and you do a post-mortem. So that if you made a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease with using these criteria, it's likely that 75% uh, of the times, if you have a good uh, clinical acumen, you will be right. But if the person had followed up with you for many years and the last diagnosis as compared to the first diagnosis, if you compare the last diagnosis, that's almost 100% correct. So clinical follow-up is the most important uh, uh, 
factor to diagnose correctly uh, idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And this has been uh, 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 this has been uh, noticed and uh, the, an importance has been given. So, uh, for example, a person who has uh, unilateral onset and persistent asymmetry on the side of onset is most. So that gives more strength to, for a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Rest tremor definitely uh, gives rise, uh, uh, give, emphasizes Parkinson's disease, and it's a progressive disorder. So if you pro follow up a patient for five, ten years, and you see that the patient has is started off with left side, now right side, then fails jaw, dysphagia, dysarthria, uh, non-motor symptoms, then you know that's progressive disorder, and you can more confidently diagnose Parkinson's disease. If there's an excellent response to levodopa, so there are other diseases also which may response to uh, have a response to levodopa, but in addition to other things, then you can diagnose Parkinson's disease. Levodopa induced chorea it usually occurs after four to five years, maybe or more, uh, and if, once those set in, may uh, that uh, encourages you that this is the Parkinson's disease only and nothing else. Uh, levodopa, levodopa response that is persist for more than five years also. The, uh, a lot of diseases like PSPP, which may have a very good response to levodopa at the outset, but usually by the third, fourth year, the response dies off. Even in some patients with MSA, they may have excellent response to symptom for, or maybe a 50% response to levodopa. But after three to five years, that goes off. So around five years or more, the levodopa response persists, then you can uh, safely say that the patient has Parkinson's disease. A clinical course of 10 years or more. So most of the atypical Parkinson's they don't uh, last for such a long time, and a very prolonged uh, course may help to uh, diagnose Parkinson's disease. Now, there are certain red, red flags, so these they don't necessarily rule out Parkinson's disease, but you may consider some other di diagnosis. So uh, rapid bursting gait, rapid bulba, uh, respiratory involvement, very severe autonomic failure. Uh, recurrent falls within one year, uh, disproportionate uh, uh, dystonias, uh, and when there are non-motor uh, features which are completely absent up to five years. So sleep dysfunction completely absent, autonomic dysfunction completely absent, hyposmia completely absent, psychiatric dysfunction completely absent, you can rule out Parkinson's disease as well. So uh, pyramidal path problems and symmetric or persistently symmetric Parkinson's these are red flags so uh, they don't mean that Parkinson's disease can be ruled out you can still uh, but you have to be careful in following up in patients so overall diagnosis largely clinical uh, imaging we saw, saw that the uh, dopamine scanning can be done MIBG's uh, cardiac spec for denervation can be done and if it is normal there is no denervation that is a red flag there is a physician opinion loophole as well and you will notice that dementia is not an exclusion criteria. So uh, DLB used to be one of the uh, atypical Parkinson's disease, but now it is considered to be the same as Parkinson's disease. And there can be some autonomy. So as soon as you find autonomic dysfunction, do not jump to the diagnosis of MSA. It may still be Parkinson's disease. Right. So uh, these criteria are largely uh, clinical. There is no pathological confirmation. Uh, there is no role of subtypes in PD in the criteria. There's no role of biomarkers, so, uh, uh, which are coming up in a big way. And path diagnosis is also not there. So as we said, the differentials are uh, atypical Parkinson's, largely in these four forms. Uh, secondary, these are as inter -medicine, internal medicine uh, graduates, you should be able to uh, pick up most of the secondary Parkinsonism. So the commonest ones are drug-induced and uh, vascular that we see. Uh, this is a slide from uh, Harrison's, so you should know this. Lower body predominant Parkinsonism, normal pressure hydrocephalus, and vascular Parkinsonism. We often see carbon monoxide related Parkinson's. So a patient will have a, uh, slept in a room in cold with uh, fire burning and they would have lost consciousness and a few months later they start having stoneness. So that's carbon monoxide related PD. So these are some, some of the scans which are not re really required to make a diagnosis, but uh, in alternative diagnosis. So in a Parkinson's disease, scans may be completely normal. There are some small findings, but we'll not discuss that. So uh, uh, midbrain atrophy in uh, with a penguin sign in PSP. Uh, this is vascular Parkinson's, uh, suggestive of small vessel disease. Uh, a patient with normal pressure, pressure hydrocephalus, you have a, a P-terminal hyperintensities uh, in multiple system atrophy, 
and hot cross bun sign again in multiple system recruiting. So this is how a DAT scan which we have is looks like. So you normally you should see the corpus triton as a comma shaped entity. In early Parkinson's, the comma shape uh, becomes asymmetrical and later on becomes dimmer and dimmer. And this is the most uh, important slide, uh, uh, which gives uh, uh, on uh, x-axis the time in years and on y-axis is the degree of disability. So this is a time when usually a patient will present to you with diadokinesia rigid tremor. Uh, but if you ask a history previously, they may have give history of constipation, uh, uh, REM sleep behavior disorder. They may have early daytime somnolence, uh, hyposmia and depression. As time progresses, you can see that uh, uh, motor manifestations still are problematic, but the psychosis, uh, 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 cognitive problems, even the non-psychosis, uh, bladder symptoms, dementia, orthostatic hypotension, those also become really disabling. So almost twice as disabling as motor symptoms, almost 20 years down the line. So management is, of course, uh, you have to improve the life reduce uh, motor non-motor problems as well as reduce drug and non-drug related complications. So this slide gives us most of the actions uh, of mechanisms of action for uh, drug therapies. So the cornerstone of therapy is levodopa. Uh, so this neuron uh, is basically coming from substantial Niagara and, uh, and synapsing with the uh, corpus triton. So the dopamine receptors are here. So uh, dopamine comes, uh, is formed in the cells from tyrosine, becomes L-dopa, uh, becomes dopamine and is comes to the uh, cell membrane, gets released, gets picked up by the dopamine receptors. Now this take, gets taken up again as well as is degraded here itself uh, using COMT and once it comes to the neurons, it is degraded using uh, MAOB, monoamine oxidase type B into levodopa which can be reused again. So uh, when we give levodopa basically it goes into the presynapse uh, directly and can gets converted into dopamine and gets released. Right? So that's, that, that is why it is the core of uh, management. Now other drugs that we may use is the MAOB inhibitors which again increase the levodopa by re reducing the degradation. Uh, we may use dopamine agonist which come directly and bind to the do uh, dopamine receptors on postsynaptic areas. We, we may reduce the degradation of uh, uh, dopamine uh, by giving COMT inhibitors. And amantadine which uh, has dual actions. Uh, the core of therapy is lipodopa carbidopa combination. So uh, whenever you suspect it uh, you start it off, it serves as a uh, therapeutic trial in diagnosis as well as in management. So start in the first time that you, patient, that you see the patient. So you start with small dose, maybe half tablet twice or half tablet thrice and gradually keep on increasing as you see the patient. And you'll notice that there is a improvement in bradykinesia and rigidity which is more than tremor. It's the first uh, choice of drug unless until contraindicated. And it may be the second choice in young onset Parkinson's disease because patients with you know, young onset sometimes they will have they'll have a lot of fluctuations with levodopa. So initially you will have good response to levodopa. So uh, the top blue part is the off time that is the patient is symptomatic, and the up, the below blue part the top blue part is a on uh, dyskinesia. So this is a side effect related type. So when the drug, drug levels are low the patient becomes symptomatic and the drug levels are high the patient becomes toxic to the system. and with progression what happens is that the uh, therapeutic window closed down this is probably because the uh, suspected that this uh, the levodopa doesn't just go take this route but also gets stored here so uh, that's that provides a large window for uh, therapeutic uh, therapy and as this window closes down you'll have either a patient who is off, has no symptoms, has uh, very severe symptoms of uh, uh, of tremor, rigidity and bradykinesia, becomes normal for a very short time and then suddenly goes into the dyskinesia phase. So this is called on and off uh, fluctuation. So that uh, 
frequent dose adjustments are required you have to keep increasing the dose or uh, splitting the dose or reducing and giving it multiple times based on the patient response one common thing that you see early on is nausea and vomiting or when you increase the dose suddenly this usually is transient and rarely requires dose uh, adjustment uh, so uh, we tend to we always say that you should take sindopa before food before meals uh if the patient has very severe nausea vomiting you can tell them to take it after food for some time you can add on domperidone also for a short time there may be autonomic dysfunction which may work get worse in with worse in with levodopa initially but that's also transient and significantly that also improves with uh, domperidone so later on all the motor fluctuations and dyskinesias come in and they require much more stringent adjustment sometimes you have to admit patients just to adjust the drugs other drugs uh, which are helpful are um, maob inhibitors so uh, they have a mild response uh, uh, they will reduce tremor bradykinesia uh, and that's why they are really helpful uh, generally they are prescribed early into the disease later on uh, they may not be as helpful but sometimes we'll have to continue those uh, after a decently high dose for example four times a day of uh, levodopa ka carbidopa combination we generally uh, add a dopamine agonist as well because it gives a longer duration of uh, action the common drugs are pramipexol ropinor bromocriptine which are available here apomorphine is can be given as an injection uh, uh, or an infusion and rotigotin which we don't have yet but the advantage of rotigotin is that it can be given as a patch so you just stick a patch uh, or two patches in, and they last for 24 hours there are two problems which are associated with dopamine agonists one is drowsiness and narcolepsy so patients when they are driving they may fall asleep so we have to uh, get a history whether they are doing that then we have to reduce the doses second is impulse control disorders which can happen with levodopa as well but are more common with dopamine agonists right they may be used earlier in young onset parkinson's disease cmp inhibitors we don't use tolcapone generally we use entacapone and that helps in reducing off time uh, rather than dyskinesias if dyskinesias are more of a problem then we reduce the dopamine dosage uh, maybe split into half half more frequently and add amantadine that helps more for dyskinesia central anticholinergics like pacitin uh, help a lot with tremor reduction but not as much as for bradykinesia the problem of course is that they have anticholinergic relatives adverse effects we should always stress on non medical therapies because they do lead to almost 20 to 30% reduction in symptoms in some patients which is a huge amount considering the number of drugs that patients have to take for a long time as well as with no adverse effects so we we routinely send patients for physiotherapy where uh, they manage the rigidity part range of motion pain relief and which and assist the patients in performing aerobic exercises which uh, uh, keep keep the patient independent for daily activities for a longer time we send them to occupation therapy so that the patients can learn activities of daily living despite having dysfunction uh, very severely affected patients learn transfers from one pl one place to the other we send them for a cognition stimulation program uh, hand function and in early disease sometimes via feedback help for tremor uh speech therapy is required when the patient has a disabling dysarthria or dysphagia or in later diseases when aspiration becomes a problem so in those uh, patients are taught what all tricks to avoid aspiration advanced therapies so uh, lesionectomy pallet pallidectomy was uh, uh practiced even before levodopa became popular this went down once the levodopa started having a very good effect the rates of lesionectomy came down uh, what took over surgical management is deep brain stimulation uh, so instead of uh, activating the circuits with uh, do dopamine uh, we uh, put in a dbs uh, lead on the subthalamic nucleus generally uh, and that helps in re restoring functions for a long time up to 5 to 7 years at least now lesionectomy had gone out but it's coming back again because a non invasive form of lesionectomy is now gradually getting available it's not there in india yet but probably will come 
so uh, it is not yet come because it's very cheap so uh, no one wants to invest in it a lot so uh, it's mr guided you just target the subthalamic nucleus and you, know, you focus ultrasound with many 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 uh, uh, sources around a thousand sources and you deep, uh, just like uh, making a lesion but there's no incision temporary relief uh, for temporary relief epimorphin infusion can be used uh, the problem is that epimorphin causes a lot of vomiting so almost 50 percent patients uh, they have to, to come out other option is to have a levodopa carbidopa continuous intestinal gel so it's a device uh, which can be uh, placed by intervention radiology or gastroenterology uh, and generally it, it, it because it's a continuous uh, infusion it uh, uh, patients even if they forget to take their medications on time some base background levodopa is always available so any disease modifying therapy so uh, this has come up in the last uh, in 2019 so glucocerebrosidase is that uh, is an enzyme which is uh, deficiency severe deficiency of which causes washer but some mutations they lead to a mild enzyme deficiency and uh, they don't present as Gaucher's disease but after some time they present as uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, these patients they have some specific uh, uh, differences like they, they have early cognition involvement, they have early autonomic involvement otherwise they appear exactly as Parkinson's disease. So these patients were picked up and uh, uh, there are two ways you can uh, 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 overcome the reduction in glucocerebrosidase activity. One is you replace the enzyme itself, or you give an, an activator of the enzyme. So, Ambroxol was found to activate glucocerebrosidase. It is very readily available. Ambroxol is a cuff stimulant which is very commonly used, uh, and it was found to increase the, the glucocerebrosidase activity, and that leads to redu reduced synuclein oligomers. Uh, which has been demonstrated pathologically as well. Now, disease prolongation as well as motor and as well as non-motor symptom re reduction has been noted uh, in trials. Of course, the large trials are still awaited. So, but this is a very promising drug. Some some people have also started doing trials using uh, ambroxol even in patients who do not have uh, GBA mutation, and uh, we'll see if those trials show any improvement in Parkinson's disease outcomes. So this is one potential uh, uh, treatment. So now, nowadays, all young onset Parkinson's disease who have autonomic dysfunction, who have uh, early cognition problems, even if they don't have, we are still sending all pay, all to look for at least a GBA mutation because that has a role uh, change in uh, uh, treatment. You'll hear a lot of uh, stem cell therapies. Uh, a lot of patients get referred. There are few cases who have uh, uh, a good response to stem cell transplantation. Uh, the one or two case reports are there. So the, this is a problem, right? So suppose this is the pool of uh, 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 dopamine neurons and you add new neurons. What happens is that the pathology is still there. So uh, synucleation deposit, synuclein deposition will occur even if the, the, the cells do get taken over, which itself is a big deal. The new cells will also get infected, right? So they also keep on getting damaged. So uh, in so uh, whether this just adding stem cells will be helpful, that is one thing which uh, some people at Japan and Australia are working on. But in addition to that, if we know the genetic mutations and uh, we can bring about a change in that as well, that will help in uh, reducing neurodegeneration as well. So this is a long way to go, but there are some trials which are coming up. So uh, this is something which is relevant to internal medicine graduates. So uh, acute presentations in PD. So uh, uh, so uh, a very common film, uh, picture: 65-year-old gentleman presents with history of fever, uh, has dysuria and abdominal pain. So he's known to have Parkinson's disease. Is on three drugs, and also a known diabetic. When you examine the patient, is confused, is blabbering, is delirious. Uh, but there is a lot of rigidity. So uh, one thing that comes up in these patients is often whether the patient has a meningeal stiffness as well. But you find a renal angle tenderness, you make a diagnosis of pyelonephritis, start on antibiotics. 
So what to do about the confusion? What to do about the rigidity? Do you increase the dose? Do you reduce the dose? What to do? Now, definitely you should not increase the dose because uh, levodopa can worsen uh, psychosis as well. So a very common problem uh, so with any systemic insult, there can be a motor worsening, then there can be a cognitive worsening. One very common thing to look for is neurolept malignant syndrome. So you do a CPK, you do a core temperature, make sure that the patient is not high, not dehydrated. Look for any drug changes that have been there. So a lot of patients will have uh, uh, dementia, or will have cognitive problems. They may have, they may forget to take changes, to, uh, change drug, uh, take drugs. Now, uh, once the patient is with you, do not change. Try not to change at least the levodopa part drastically. Uh, keep it the same doses. Uh, what the patient was taking. Anticholinergics is something that we may ch change. There are two reasons for this, in this case per se, and in general also. One is anticholinergics will worsen cognition. So a person who already has started having a delirium with infections is likely to have worse and worse cognition eventually. So that is one reason why you should, so we should consider stopping anticholinergic. If the patient is on a very high doses, we should not stop suddenly. We should maybe taper over two to days and then stop. The other problem is this patient has come with a pyelonephritis. Again, uh, anticholinergics will cause urinary retention and that will lead to more infections. So, uh, that will cause more problems. So, that's another reason why we should consider stopping anticholinergics. Other drugs we should consider the same, to continue the same dose. If the psychosis doesn't settle, then we may consider reducing levodopa or amantidine doses as well. So, uh, which antipsychotics to give if the patient is hallucinating a lot or has frank psychosis so only two drugs are considered to be safe which are available in india one is quetiapine so we should do an ecg and then before starting because we may have to start a quetiapine and second is clopine the problem with clozapine is uh, 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 agranular cytosis so we should do counts before starting clozapine most of the other drugs may worsen parkinson so if, uh, older uh, older drugs like haloperidol even newer drugs like crisperidone, they may worsen the Parkinson's. So we should avoid those drugs. Then third drug which is not available in India yet is called Pimavanserin. But when it becomes available, it's specific for Parkinson's disease related psychosis. So uh, if we should target that the patient sleeps at night, gets up in the morning, give good uh, daylight and slowly, slowly as the infection gets in control, the uh, psychosis will also get reversed. That's all. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Sir? So I would uh, like to, uh, just before going, I'd like to invite everyone to visit our department. Uh, during your postings and all, make sure that you see enough. Because the diagnosis is largely clinical. You should have, if, and if you see more and more, more and more patients, you will be more, much more con confident and it, it's very easy, but you should see enough patients. That's the only thing. Thank you. Sorry, Jenny. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, if there are no further questions, we'll close the session. So thank you so much, sir, for coming. Thanks, sir.